Welcome to this PCR uh, webinar roundtable on coronary bifurcation lesions. Uh, this is a session that is entitled to the Imaging and Functional Guidance for Left Main Bifurcation PCI, and it's the part of a series of six uh, seminars dedicated to the coronary bifurcation lesions. My name is Javier Escanet uh, from Madrid, Spain, and I have the pleasure of having with us uh, our friends, my friends, uh, Manuel Barbato from Naples and Nicolas Amabili from Paris. They are uh, here with us uh, today to share with you some uh, interesting uh, concepts and, and, and knowledge on how to use intracoronary physiology and imaging in clinical decision making in left micro bifurcations and uh, particularly we'll be paying a lot of attention to how to perform guidance of interventions in the setting of left main bifurcations. So thank you very much for being uh, with us. Uh, please uh, remember that they are here with you to share their experience in the clinical field, so do not hesitate to interrupt us any time with your comments, with your uh, questions. We will, of course, address them uh, during this uh, webinar. Now, this is uh, the topic uh, that we are going to be dealing uh, today. Those are images that you may find every day in your everyday practices. Uh, and uh, let's see how Emanuele and is reacting to this uh, particular uh, setting. Uh, perhaps uh, we, can, we could ask uh, Emanuele first, what do you think of the case number one from this angiographic stand still uh, image? Well, Javier, if you agree, I did myself case number one, so I would like more to express my opinion on uh, the case that Nicolas has, has done, leaving him the chance to uh, give his opinion on, the, on, on case number one. This case, case number two, um, to me presents the challenge that despite I don't see much of disease in the distal left main coronary artery and in the proximal LED, there is a tight lesion on the osteal uh, circumflex. And I guess even if at the first glance I would not say it is a distal left main disease, it will turn to be a, a PCI of the left main. There is no way we can avoid the stent, uh, would go back to the left main. Therefore, uh, imaging here would be particularly useful in uh, characterizing the um, distribution of the disease in this, uh, in this bifurcation and what would be the ideal technique to, to use. Nicola, what would you like to comment about the other case, uh, case number one? Well, I think it's a very interesting and challenging case because we see that there, we have an association of a distal left main uh, stenosis and a prox LAD tight stenosis. And with the angio alone, I think it's quite difficult to really assess the severity uh, and the significance of this left main lesion. And we know that in this particular situation, uh, having or not the left main lesion will definitely change the, our strategy and we might uh, switch from PCI to cabbage or not, depending on the, on the result and on this significance. So definitely we, we need something more than angio. Well, thank you very much for your comments. I mean, obviously what you are highlighting are those uh, challenges that we face in this particular scenario. And uh, as we anticipated to our colleagues, the role of this webinar is basically to move into how intracoronary physiology and imaging can help us uh, in, in dealing with these challenges. And um, I think we have grouped actually the potential help of these techniques in two, uh, three different areas. First, at the level of the pre-intervention. Um, you can use physiology and imaging to establish the functional relevance of the left main bifurcation. You can assess also the effect of uh, concomitant stenosis in the coronary tree. And you should also um, take the opportunity of using these techniques to define the PCI strategy. And we will see this in the cases that we will show you uh, later. After the intervention, Imaging and physiology can be very important to optimize the PCI results and also to document the functional result of PCI in the main vessel. Uh, but also, imaging can be very useful to prevent complications of left main PCI, particularly by making very accurate uh, wiring of the side branch, particularly in techniques where you are going to perform to, uh, kissing dentition or two stent techniques, and also to prevent stent distortion. That is a frequently ignored problem in this uh, proximal location of the coronary arteries. Now, 
by now we have a lot of studies that have consistently reported that when you use IBUS to guide your interventions in left main, the procedural outcomes is better and you have less events in the long term. The patient has less events in the long term. And those are some of these studies summarized in this meta-analysis. The evidence is so conclusive that the ESC guidelines of 2018 consistently also to this, with this evidence highlighted the importance of IBUS guidance in the um, specific anatomical setting of the left main coronary artery stenosis. Now, physiology also plays a very important role in uh, dealing with the stenosis in the left main. There are many studies that have demonstrated that you can make safe decision making in terms of deferring those stenosis that you have in the left main uh, when you have an FFR that is uh, more than 0.80. Now, we will deal in this seminar with specific aspects of using FFR in the left main that are slightly different to other uh, uh, settings in the coronary arteries, but that can be very important for accurate measurements and to proper interpretation. Now, all this information that we are going to have will be very relevant for again, very specific aspects of uh, PCI in the left main, just to highlight one of them. When we are working in the left main, we are dealing with a vessel which is very large, which in many occasions has diameters of more than five millimeters, and that in many cases, like this one that you have in the screen, uh, have drastic uh, uh, reduction in size when you move to the side branch, like the LAD or the circumflex. Now, in order to choose an stent that is able to achieve this uh, expansion ability, you have to have very accurate dimensions, measurement of dimensions. You have to, be, to make sure that sometimes you can implant a four millimeter stent in what it looks like a three millimeter or 3.5 millimeter uh, distal branch. Uh, and we'll see how all this uh, is uh, supported by the use of intracoronary imaging in left main stenting. So with this, uh, we will move to one of the cases from our uh, everyday practice. The first case is a case that Emanuele Barbato performed. Emanuele, perhaps you can guide us with your case. Yes, uh, Javier. This was a female patient, 69 years old um, uh, lady, no diabetes. I, I like to mention this um, specifically on the slide. Uh, in the past medical history, this patient was uh, irradiated uh, for a left side breast cancer. She presented at our observation with stable angina and with uh, an inconclusive uh, exercise ECG. Right coronary angiogram uh, didn't show significant uh, uh, epicardial disease. Moving on the left coronary angiogram, uh, you can see already from these two projections that we selected, starting perhaps uh, from the one on the left side, that this was indeed a complex disease. We have an ambiguous distal left main lesion, plus a tight proximal uh, LAD stenosis at the level of this large first diagonal branch. I've also picked this uh, still frame here uh, that uh, is nicely demonstrating the uh, two lesions in sequence, the distal left main ambiguous lesion there, plus the proximal LAD lesion. And on this spider view, you can appreciate the, first of all, the eccentricity of this distal left main lesion. If we look at it from here, it seems that the left main is not interested at all from the stenosis. And another aspect that I would like to highlight with this, uh, with this slide is the fact that three major branches are involved in this, uh, in this uh, branching, in this uh, segment of the left coronary artery. So this is in summary, Javier, uh, what we have seen. I don't, I don't know if you want to take, take over here. Yeah, I think, uh, as you say, this is a real life example of what we uh, face uh, frequently in the CAT lab. You know, I'm sure that many of the colleagues that are uh, with us in this webinar will recognize, you know, the, the planning of how to uh, address a complex anatomy like this one, um, probably what we can do is to share with our colleagues also the images once again so they can have a look to the angiogram and in the meantime reflect on what will be the optimal treatment in this particular patient. Uh, should we consider cabbage in this patient? Should we consider uh, percutaneous intervention? 
uh, how to perform a percutaneous intervention in these patients. Do we need more information? So I'm looking forward to the comments of the, um, of the colleagues. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, I will ask Nicola, what is your uh, impression about these options that we have here? What would you be your way of proceeding? Once again, I think that the both uh, strategies might be valuable in this situation, but we need definitely more information. And the crucial point, I think, here will be the significance of the distal left main. So, uh, why? Because um, it will influence the syntax score of this patient, and I would say the first information we need here will be the f syntax score of the patient, and uh, the second question will be the significance and uh, the, 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 to know if this left main lesion is significant and has a physiological impact, because uh, once again it might change the, 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 the situation. We have here a patient with a left main and a proxel AD. She's non-diabetic, and we know that the guidelines tells, tell us that with a syntax score equal or over 33, this patient should be referred to cabbage. But if the, if the left main is not present, if it not, is not significant, then I think we can uh, provide a simple PCI of the proxel AD. Thank you very much. I mean, these are very, very important uh, remarks. Um, Emanuele, how did you address this uh, particular aspect? Nicolas, uh, as a point actually, is right in saying that the, um, really the game changer here is the distal left main. I fully agree with you. And that was also our concern. Uh, and as a matter of fact, that was the first thing we did. Uh, it's not because we agreed on what to prepare here. But it was also our concern to really risk stratify this patient. And, and we have learned how the syntax score has become important, even in the latest guideline to which uh, Javier was alluding to. Syntax score is really the gatekeeper between surgery and uh, percutaneous core intervention. In this case, uh, syntax score, anatomical syntax score, uh, it was 33. That would really favor surgery, bypass surgery in these patients. Um, so um, that is why uh, we thought, Javier, to um, first of all make sure that this distal left main was uh, uh, in, uh, in the need of being treated with, uh, with PCI or cabbage. And that is why we uh, decided to perform invasive functional assessment with fractional full reserve to make sure that this left main would be of functional impact. So if you agree, I can, I can move on and uh, just... Uh, share with you uh, what are the steps, the setting that we normally use to uh, perform appropriate uh, invasive functional evaluation of the left main. What we like to do is to perform a proper calibration, a proper, proper equalization of the two pressures, the one measured at the tip of the guiding catheter and the one measured by the uh, pressure sensor. And to do that, we, um, we prefer to disengage the guiding catheter and to position the pressure wire the pressure sensor at the level of the tip of the guiding catheter. This can be safely done in the ascending aorta. Once done that, uh, we should then engage the uh, guiding catheter in order to safely um, navigate the pressure wire within one of the two daughter branches. But once the pressure wire is, is positioned safely distal into the vessel, what we like to do is to gently push on the pressure wire in order to slightly disengage the guiding catheter in order to um, you know, have again the same uh, starting condition uh, as we did the uh, equalization, which is what is depicted in this cartoon. At this point is the moment to induce hyperemia. Um, intravenous adenosine infusion is the uh, proper way to, to do that, but if you are quick enough and smart enough, you can also inject an intracoronary molus of adenosine, remembering to uh, disengaging the guiding catheter when you have injected the bolus intracoronarily. If we have a distal location of the left main, we might perform uh, the equalization with the guiding catheter engaged in the left main, even though I think it is, uh, it is always a, a, good, a good rule to, to do that with the guiding catheter disengaged. But we should not forget to measure the uh, FFR with the pressure wire in both daughter branches, so in the LAD and into the uh, circumflex. Coming back to our patient, Javier, what we did in this case, we positioned uh, the pressure wire into the LAD first. We should not forget that in this case, we had uh, two stenosis in series, one into the distal left main and one into the proximal LAD. 
the FFR value that we measured into the LAD was 0.76. Uh, this value takes into account the cumulative contribution of both lesions. We position then the pressure wire into the circumflex, and in this case we measure the value of 0.99. Now the question comes as to whether the FFR measured in the circumflex reliably reflects the true functional impact of this distal left main, even if we are in the presence of the distal, left, uh, distal LED stenosis. Well, the answer in this specific case is yes, and this uh, relies upon the data coming from Stanford, showing that if we measure an FFR of above 0.85 in the daughter vessel that is non-stenotic, this will seldom turn into a true FFR below 0.80, once treated the distal stenosis into the LAD. This applies in case the lesion is uh, located into the uh, proximal and uh, proximal segment of the LAD and it's not subocclusive. So in our specific case, the answer is yes, having measured an FFR of 0.99, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, means that this left main is non-functionally significant. And we can skip this and we can concentrate on the treatment of the LAD. Yeah, that's very, very interesting, uh, Emanuele. And, th and I think that, um, it, first of all, I think it was very interesting that you shared with us the fact that uh, when you're assessing left main stenosis, you have to have a specific uh, care in, in making sure that your sensor has been properly equalized out of the coronary ostium. Um, there was one of the colleagues that was uh, suggesting to perform um, an, an FFR pullback to assess in the same way, the, in the same, in, in one setting, also the effect of the LAD stenosis. Um, I think also what you what you have shown us is very very interesting because what you are saying is that if your FFR across the left main is more than 0.85, and provided that you don't have a chronic total occlusion or you don't have a two proximal stenosis in the LAD, you can reliably say that the effect it will have it will be marginal. Um, I'm sure that some colleagues will be thinking about the use of IFR, which of course facilitates making pullbacks much easier. Probably at this stage, I know that there are a couple of studies uh, upcoming on the value of uh, IFR in the left main, but it's true that for the time being, most of the information we have regarding safe deferral of uh, PCI in the left main comes from the, from, from the perspective of FFR. Um, and of course, the other question that I'm sure that many colleagues have in mind is, what about IVUS? I mean, can you use IVUS to assess functional relevance of an stenosis in the left main? I think that many people are relying on that. Uh, Nicola, you want to comment on, on, on IVUS and imaging for yeah. the um, left main? I agree that IVUS has been proposed as a, as a method to uh, assess the severity of the left main uh, lesions. And uh, it's still quite debated because also reliable, the cutoff points, the cutoff values that are being used in the different studies might vary. And for example, we know that the cutoff points um, are different in Asian patients compared to Caucasian patients. And so in the literature, the cutoff ranges from 4.5 to 6.5 square millimeters. But it's still something that we can use. On the other, on the other end, I think that, uh, not I think, but OCT has not proven uh, anything in this particular situation, um, there is no data. And also we have to keep in mind that the surfaces that we measure with OCT are always smaller than the surfaces measured by IVUS. So it's not that easy to take the cutoff values uh, measured by IVUS and use them in OCT. So I will be very, very cautious uh, about uh, using OCT in this situation. And, and of course, if it is an osteal stenosis, you will not be able to use um, uh, OCT at all. Uh, of course, uh, we know that the osteal left main lesions are a limitation of OCT, OCT. And in case you've got a left main lesion involving the ostium, you definitely should not use OCT and prefer IVUS. Okay. Very good. So, um, Emanuele, what we're very interested is in knowing how this information you obtained so far uh, influenced what came later in the way of treating your patient. Can you show us? Sure. So, based on what we just said before, we excluded on a functional basis that these uh, distal left main stenosis would be of a concern for these patients. So, we focused, as I said before, on the proximal LED stenosis. Um, and we actually recalculated, we restratify the risk of this patient by calculating the syntax score again, but this time not computing within the formula the left main disease. 
So we recalculated the so-called functional syntax score, which gives us a value of 12. We are perfectly within the, the range of uh, syntax score value that would pose equipoise between PCI and surgery in the, uh, in, in the treatment of these, uh, of these patients. Therefore, our decision was to perform an OCT-guided PCI of the uh, left anterior descending artery. What am I asking to uh, my OCT assessment when performing it? In this specific case, what I want to know from OCT assessment is whether this uh, lesion, this plaque, needs to be modified with specific technique. Let's not forget that this was a patient that was irradiated for uh, left uh, breast um, cancer. What will be the stent length? What will be the stent size? And most of all, what are the uh, geographic um, uh, reference points from where to start and where, where, where to stop our standing. Let's not forget the complex anatomy of this distal trifurcation. So um, going to the OCT, and I will only show still frames of our co-registration, which is actually a fantastic tool and opportunity that we have nowadays to obtain in one picture all the information we need. So if we look at the upper left corner, we have the coronary angiogram. On the upper right corner, we have the cross-section of the OCT imaging. On the uh, bottom side of our slide, we have the longitudinal view of OCT. So we have really a 3D special uh, reconstruction of our uh, coronary artery, and we can perfectly uh, uh, allocate and actually localize where a specific anatomic uh, uh, disease or, or uh, landmark is located in order to know exactly what we are doing within the coronary artery. So the first question is answered by the OCT by telling us that the distal lengthening zone in this case in a segment that was, uh, in our opinion, healthy from uh, uh, an OCT point of view was more than 3.5 millimeter. We learned from OCT that this plaque was mostly a fibrolipidic plaque, so not requiring specific uh, plaque modification technique. Third, we learned that there is a nice proximal landing zone of less than 3.5 millimeters, certainly uh, ending the stand before the carina. Yeah, and that is, uh, that is very interesting, Emanuele, because there was one colleague that was uh, asking uh, before having this information if you could do that, but now uh, you have demonstrated that you can do it based on imaging. Yeah. Right? Exactly. And last and not least important information was the lesion length. In this case, I know from OCT that I can use a stent of about 28 millimeters in order to nicely cover this 25 millimeter uh, lesion length. So these are all the questions with answer that I could retrieve from the OCT pullback. Now I'm ready to do my, my treatment. Fantastic. So what is very, very interesting of this point is, uh, uh, again, and that is the aim of the, of, the, of the webinar, is highlighting how the difference with angiography, with information that you have collected so far, you are taking decisions that are supported by evidence that is obtained by imaging and physiology. Um, so obviously, very important ones. I mean, you, you, you have highlighted that you have now the proper landing zones uh, for your stent and the length. Uh, and you also highlighted that because you have a, a good correlation with angiography, you will decrease the possibility of having a geographical uh, mismatch, that you will be placing your stents in the wrong place. So I think that this is a very interesting point. Looking forward to see how you continue with the case. So to optimize our time and to dedicate more time to discussion, I just selected the final angiograms. Um, what I did in this case, it summarized in the text. Uh, I predilated this lesion with a 3 millimeter balloon. I implanted a drug loading stand 3.528 millimeters based on the metrics that we obtained by OCT, post dilated with a 4.0 non-compliant balloon. Angiographically, looks pretty okay. This is the um, OCT assessment at the end of the uh, PCI, after done all the optimization needed. From the longitudinal view, I think you can appreciate that the stand is nicely opposed to the vessel wall and nicely expanded. And what I like to do more and more uh, uh, lately is the assessment of the uh, functional result of my PCI by repeating fractional flow reserve at the end giving me a value of 0.93. This reassures me, first, that I did a good job on the LED, and secondly, this 0.93 uh, 
uh, might reflect the residual disease of the distal left main, confirming once more that the decision we took in the diagnostic phase was appropriate not to treat this left main up, up front. Fantastic, very interesting case. I think that we could um, discuss a bit um, some of the learning points of this of the case. I think that from my perspective, what I have learned again is that you have uh, made decisions on, on very solid grounds, that you have tools that allow um, accurate answers to very specific uh, um, questions of the procedure. Nicola, you want to comment something on, on the case? No, I think that's, I mean, it's a very interesting and very didactic case, and it also shows us uh, just, once again, it, it explains that angio alone is not enough to treat these kind of complex patients, and, and it really, it's a nice illustration of how these uh, tools help us in the CAF lab uh, in daily practice. Using a four millimeter balloon to post dilate the stain in the proximal part is something that many people probably will not do if they are just um, eyeballing or using angiography as a guidance. What do you think? Well, maybe because uh, uh, I did a lot of imaging in the prox LAD, but I'm not shocked, definitely. And, mm -hmm. and for me, that's what I try to teach the fellow is, uh, is please, uh, uh, LAD, prox LAD is always at least 3.5 and, and I'm not shocked to get up to 4, even sometimes 4.5. Do, do you think that the, the eye becomes re-educated by intracoronary imaging, Emmanuel? I fully, I fully believe uh, that is correct what you're saying, what Nicola is just saying. By doing more and more intravascular imaging, we get, we get used uh, to the real dimension of the of the lumen of the vessel, yeah. which which is something that has been also uh, investigated in the past in some of the IVOS guided uh, PCI studies. They exactly saw this phenomenon: lack of benefit with intravascular imaging. Sometimes was mostly driven by the fact that these operators were so much used to an intravascular guided percutaneous core intervention that they were not able anymore to leave a suboptimal in geographic stent right. result. They were actually optimizing the stent result with the IVUS uh, uh, view, even if they did not perform an IVUS with an IVUS view on the, on the PCI. Now, regarding the sizing and answering one of the comments from one of the old colleagues in attending the webinar, um, what is your rationale? Do you use the EEL as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a way of sizing your stents? Do you use the luminal edge? What do you use? Uh, the, the trend is more and more to, um, you know, to, to um, have the same kind of criteria that we used to have with IVUS also with OCT. We saw that in the first, um, with the first experience with OCT, we used to implant the stent only relying on the luminal size of the vessel. Now more and more we try to measure EL to EL, like we used to do in the past with the IVUS, uh, but it's not often easy to, um, to really identify where the external elastic lamina is. So sometimes we struggle to identify what is the healthy part of the coronary segment in order to be sure that we are measuring correctly. But that is certainly the way to go, trying to measure the true size relying on EEL. Any comments on your side? On no, okay. I, I really agree with uh, Emmanuel and, uh, and uh, in our institution, we definitely try to stick with this EEL to EEL uh, measurement. So that's what I do in my in my cases and i can also add that when your landing zone is a healthy vessel the el to el and the uh, luminal diameter are quite comparable but it's my it's different when your uh, landing zone is not healthy yeah, i think that the illumin 4 is going to give us uh, answers on this because it's using this approach another colleague is asking about the um, use of ffr in the diagonal branch i mean you were working in an area that you have mm the diagonal branches. Do you think that making FFR in diagonal branches that you are going to jail uh, can be important to predict uh, occlusion of the vessel? Or what value do you see before stenting for FFR in, in side branches? You know, it's, uh, it's very difficult to predict what will be the functional impact of the plug shift that you might have after stenting implantation. So even if you measure upfront an, a, a normal FFR, a preserved FFR in a diagonal branch, that doesn't mean that this cannot turn to a significant uh, uh, lesion afterward. On the contrary, whether you would measure, in case you would measure an abnormal FFR in the diagonal branch, then you might perhaps choose, but this depends also on the anatomical characteristics of the stenosis, you might want to do a two uh, stenting technique, mm -hmm. but it's debatable. There are no really um, hard data to support this. 
But for sure, uh, there are studies, uh, certainly a couple of studies from Dr. Ku, having shown that measuring uh, FFR after standing of the left main can be in a way predicted by the, pr let's say, the amount of flow into the side branch. As long as we have preserved TM3 flow into the side branch, even if we have a pinched side branch, diagonal branch, we might be almost sure that the FFR more or less will be preserved. So um, I'm, I'm sure that many of the colleagues uh, have been impressed by the use of OCT for guiding the procedure. Um, this has been the first approach with OCT, but obviously you can apply it uh, in more specific settings, particularly when we are talking about bifurcation, using some of the tools and the opportunities that the technique has. And I think that the case that you are going to share now with us, uh, Nicola, will go in detail into this aspect. Is that correct? Absolutely, Javier. So let me move to this case. So it's a 63-year-old man with a previous coronary artery disease. He underwent uh, right coronary artery PCI two years before and now is referred again to the institution for a stable angina with a positive stress echocardiography showing anterolateral hypokinesia. So uh, we're going to move directly to the PCI. So I have to admit that the right coronary artery was okay and now the uh, you know that one of the colleagues, uh, sorry to interrupt you, was asking before, I was uh, waiting until now to ask you whether uh, with this uh, osteal stenosis of the left circumflex you will consider surgery from the very beginning. Do you think that this is, is, is something that for you is an obstacle or not? Mm, quite personally, in our institution, uh, the surgeon did not really... Uh, um, they prefer to apply a PCI strategy if the left main is not, is the left LAD is not uh, diseased. So that's what we use. I don't know how it goes in your institution, Emmanuel. Well, you know, this is, a, this is really a, an interesting case. Now that I see the moving image, unlike to what I said before on the steel frames, I see that there is also some disease in the proximal to mid LAD. Unless I'm, I'm wrong, but there is some disease also there. So, uh, this is a case where I really would like to have uh, more information. I, I cannot just take a decision based on injury, but let's say if the LED would also be involved beyond the ostium of the circ, I would discuss this with the surgeon. Yeah. If there is also only an osteal circumflex, this would be more our call, more a call for intervention. But I think that probably what also what we could uh, highlight for the colleagues is that it is true that probably the osteal circumflex is one of the most challenging yeah. uh, scenarios for PCI and also one of the most important places for having restenosis. I mean, it's right. one of the stem failure. So if you embark into treating um, osteal circumflex, you really have to do a good job. You have yeah. to really ensure that you get a very good job because it is true probably the concern of the colleague that this is a very tricky and complex yeah. scenario. In addition, we should also not forget no surgeon would ever bring this patient to a surgical theater without the LED being diseased. Because, you know, taking this patient to the surgical theater would mean to place a mammary artery on an LED that unless I'm mistaken, if it's not diseased, no surgeon would ever operate only on a circumflex. So it's, it's really a complicated situation, this one. Yeah. Very good. So let's see how you proceed. So in this case, we went for uh, PCI. And so that's the first. Um, so, of course, you notice that there was uh, also tight stenosis on the first marginal branch that was promptly fixed with a 2.75 per 23 millimeter implantation. And then we went for OCT guided left main intervention. And there are many reasons. First, I think that in left main, we definitely have to, when we go for PCI, we have to provide the best possible result and I think that imaging guidance can help us to provide this uh, uh, optimal result. Then I think it's also a good, po a good case for OCT because there is no osteal involvement of the left main so it's definitely we can have nice pictures and also this situation might be challenging because we see that there is a discrepancy between the diameter of the left main and the diameter of the, of the proximal circumflex. So uh, the sizing of the stent and the sizing of the pot will be very crucial. So, we first performed a, fir uh, a, no uh, a first OCT run, and this is a very important point. Uh, and this OCT run has to provide us many information, as 
previously mentioned by Emanuele. The first one is the lesion analysis. We have to check the plaque composition, especially the, if there is some calcium, because in case of calcium, that might be a little more complicated. We have to check the minimal lumen area in left main and also in the circumflex there. And very, very important, we have to correctly identify proximal and diastole landing zones and the reference segment dimensions. Why? Because based on these analyses, then we will be able to correctly size our stent and correctly size our uh, pot balloon. So the stent diameter is very important, will be chosen according to the diastol landing zone dimension from, with an EL to EL diameter and the pot diameter will be uh, the pot di balloon diameter will be chosen according to the proximal landing zone dimension and of course the length, stent length will be chosen according to the distance between prox and diastol landing zones so this slide illustrates you why it's important to correctly identify the landing zones because uh, of course um, the best option will be to take uh, the normal vessel uh, as landing zone uh, but sometimes, as mentioned by Emmanuel, it's not that easy and we can have some diffusely diseased uh, arteries. And uh, you have four, uh, three kinds of plaques, fibrous, calcified and lipid plaque. And you see that uh, when you implant the, um, your, your stent edges into this plaque, you increase the risk of, long, of uh, short and long-term complication. And the worst scenario is to implant your stent within a lipid plaque because then you really increase the risk of dissection, restenosis, and peri-PCI-MI. So in our patient, these are the results. So we've got a long view there, and of course the run will go from proximal circumflex to uh, left main. You see that we have a nice pullback that can uh, very, very well analyze the, the mid and diastole left main. This is the prox uh, circumflex uh, minimal lumen area. It's 1.6, so it's very tight lesion. And we are able to identify the diastole landing zone that will overlap the previously implanted uh, marginal uh, stent. And we'll see that the EL to EL diameter is 3.0. And when we go a little more proximal up to the um, left main, we see that the EL to EL diameter is 4.3 millimeter. So, Emanuele, with all this in mind with the NGO and the OCT and all this information, um, what will be your strategy in this bifurcation? Well, actually, this OCT uh, thought us uh, different aspects of this, um, this anatomy. Well, first, distal landing zone, it's three millimeters, but I guess we would all um, land our stand within the previously stented segment, I guess, more or less. So we have there a good reference. But what was really informative for me was the uh, distribution of the plaque at the ostium of the circumflex, which is eccentric, mostly located far from the carina. Uh, then what I see, even if we don't have a pullback from the LAD back to the left main, I have the impression, unfortunately, we just have this, uh, uh, this, this line there. But I, at least before, I had the impression there was no disease at the ostium of the um, LAD, which is at least in the first two, three millimeters, which is reassuring. And of course, as expected, we have a, a nice mismatch between in diameter between the uh, osteal circumflex and the left main. So to summarize and have these findings relevant to my practice, what I would do here is a provisional stenting, one stent technique. There is a wide angle, so I would place my stent from the circumflex back to the left main, trying to optimize the result with pot with kissing, opening the stem struts, and then repot. That would be my strategy. Very good. So, so I will show you what we did. And of course, the length is, is around 15. So based on that, we implanted a stand from the diastole left main to the ostral circumflex. Uh, and we used a 3.0 per 15 millimeter stent. And we uh, subsequently uh, used a uh, non-compliant 4.5 per 6 millimeter balloon to create, to, to pot the lesion. And then we proceed to the wires exchange. And uh, so, and then we per after the wire exchange, we perform the second OCT run. And um, that's where it's getting really exciting because we are now able to use a new tool with a 3D reconstruction with OCT that will help us to analyze precisely and accurately the side branch wire position 
before processing to side dilation or to final kissing balloon. And at this stage of the procedure, we are also able to identify early complications and potentially correct them. So that's the RCT run number two. You see that the side, angiographically, it looks uh, pretty okay. Uh, with the 3D we have the 3D reconstruction and you see that the stent is very well overexpanded in the proximal, in the distal part of the left main. We see that the distal part of our 3.0 stent is correctly opposed to the, uh, with a small overlapping section with the previous stent. There is still um, some underexpansion on the osteal uh, circumflex uh, lesion. If we go more proximal, that's the, the proximal part of, the, of our stent, and we see that there is a, a mild degree of malaposition. Also, we perform our part, and that's very interesting because, in my experience, this malaposition in the left main frequently occurs in the very proximal, the first millimeter of the stent, probably because the part is not uh, optimal. To my, to my remind, uh, Nicola, can, can you remember me what is the degree of malaposition that we should react upon and we should do something more? That, that, that's a very good point. I think that now we have uh, um, some, um, a consensus document that indicated us that um, be, uh, if the degree, if the, the distance between the struts and the vessel wall is below 300 micrometer, it's not really um, sound to correct it because then it will resolve uh, spontaneously over time. But if we have a malaposition over 300 micrometer and with a length of more one millimeter and an extension, a radial extension of over 180 degrees, then that makes sense to correct. It's very interesting also that uh, imaging provides also a way of benchmarking your results. I mean, when you when you are performing regularly in imaging, you realize that in many occasions you are having malaposed stents, etc., etc. Et in addition to reeducating your eye, also provides you an insight on how well implanted are your stents. And what I was looking to the longitudinal reconstruction with this beautiful visualization of the stent struts is exactly what we were showing at the beginning, that the proximal stent uh, cells have been um, expanded uh, at a maximum by the pot that you use with a large uh, pot balloon. You can see that very nicely. And that at that point is when it is critical to have a stent that uh, allows a maximal expansion Absolutely. of the stent. I, I don't know if you recall what type of stent was this particular one. Uh, it was a uh, Xion Sierra uh, stent. Okay. So, but it's, it's important to, to be familiar with your stents uh, uh, that, that you can use. I mean, particularly the, the Onyx stent, for example, is one that uh, has dedicated large sizes for left main that we use uh, a lot. But it's beautiful to see how you have a complete different uh, widening of the cells over there. Yeah, if we see that now the cells are, are very different sizes. And I would like also to, I to highlight that this very proximal malaposition might be also due to the tapered size mm -hmm. and tapered shape of the left main that is very common yeah. and uh, so the more proximal you get in this kind of uh, in this uh, type of tapered uh, left main and of course the higher the risk of malaposition another thing that may be uh, interesting to highlight many people when you're treating the the the, self, the, the osteal circumflex feel concern of implanting the stent up to the left main because they believe that they may cause a left main stenosis. Oh, sorry, restenosis. But what you can see here is that actually you are not stretching the left main. The left main is actually you're you're touching with the with the with the uh, stent struts, but you are not stretching it. So therefore the possibility of having a uh, uh, restenosis which is always kept some relationship with the degree of damage that you cause to the vessel wall are very small. So it is slightly different. Absolutely. Very good. So could you show us what yeah. you did next? And then we reconstructed, we used a 3D reconstruction mode and we were able to assess the position of our side, of our um, second wire into the osteal left uh, LAD, as you see here. And um, to us, it appeared to be in the correct position, which is the most distal cell or the cell connecting to the carina. And 
Do you want to... Uh, no, that's, that? that's fantastic. I mean, I think that this is very, very impressive. Um, obviously, having a technique that allows that degree of granularity nowadays is amazing. I think that um, most of the colleagues know that to achieve that beautiful shape of the um, provisional stent that you implanted there, you have to uh, wire with the, the most distal uh, cell when you are doing provisional stenting. On the contrary, if you are doing uh, um, a two stent technique, you try to enter with your wire in the most proximal cell. And the availability of this uh, technique that allows visualization of the position of the cells uh, in relation to the opening of the side branch has allowed, as we can see here, a lot of proposals of research of trying to optimize your procedure to the point of selecting where you are crossing with the wire to uh, obtain the optimal deformation of the stent, the optimal shape uh, obtained to, of, of any of the two the, the techniques. So I think that we have no comparable tools uh, today, uh, except for OCT, just to get rid of this uh, accurate uh, assessment of the, uh, of the wire into the side branch. That was something that was not available before with IVUS, for example. Yeah, absolutely. So the OCT demonstrated that the wire was in the correct position to um, treat the osteal LAD. So that's some, in routine we, we do a side dilation and we finish the procedure with a side branch, uh, with, sorry, with a report into the uh, left main and we also corrected uh, the proximal malaposition. Remember that there was um, also uh, under expansion of the circumflex that we uh, fixed with uh, 3.0 per 12 non complete balloon. And this is the final end result. And now we are okay or good to uh, perform a third and last OCT run that will help us to finally assess our result and evaluate the need of a further optimization. And we will um, uh, try to identify some acutely acquired uh, PCI pitfall that might be corrected in order to uh, uh, increase, uh, to improve the outcome, especially severe malaposition, uh, especially in the proximal age, the under expansion, which is a major trigger for restenosis and also so to acute uh, thrombosis, dissection and hematoma and also thrombus. So that is our final OCT result. Use, this is the carina. We can see a slight degree of white thrombus just on, on the wire, but it's not concerning it's something that you really, that you frequently identify during uh, uh, this kind of procedure. This is the, now the proximal age of our stent, and you see the malaposition has been fixed, and there is, and it's uh, completely round. Round, it's not elliptic. Something that is interesting ah. in addressing one of the questions of the colleagues is that. Um, if, of course, when you, when you um, expand a stent and you widen so much the cells, the scaffolding properties of the stents decrease. Yeah. So that's uh, something that you have to take into account. Uh, obviously, what happens here is that the point that of the, the stent that you have expanded at the maximum size coincides with an area where you don't have plaque. But uh, would you like to comment, Emanuele, on what is the relevance of seeing protrusion of plaque through a stent uh, when you implanted it, in the left main particularly? Well, uh, we have a wide, uh, wide diameter there. I'm not sure that would be uh, much of an impact. In general terms, uh, it would be preferable not to have protrusion of plaque. The point is that sometimes we cannot just avoid it, especially when we have uh, a large uh, burden of disease this is not the case, as you mentioned. The, the left main segment was not that diseased up front. That is why we didn't see much of uh, plaque burden. There is another aspect, uh, perhaps, that was not yet uh, highlighted on the importance to perform a final OCT assessment, which is um, excluding possible dissection, not really at the age, but also at the ostium of the LAD. After all, what we did was, uh, you know, uh, we, we uh, entered through the stent struts towards the proximal LED. We open up the cells. You know, angiogram, we know, is a limited tool to, um, to disclose uh, very small dissection. I would not uh, feel very much reassured to leave even a minor dissection at the ostium of an LAD. So having done OCT, even if you didn't do it from the uh, uh, LAD to the left main, but I have seen that you turned around, perhaps you, you saw it much better than what we saw it uh, in this uh, still frame, excluding that there is dissection of the osteum LED. 
is for me uh, an important information that makes me reassured and can um, conclude this procedure in a safe, in a safe manner. There was one colleague that was saying, would uh, a drug eluting balloon be a, a, an alternative in this um, left uh, circumflex, the uh, ostium? I personally do not have any experience with drug eluting balloon in de novo uh, native coronary artery disease. I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure that it will be my uh, preferred uh, strategy. Do you have any more experience, Emmanuel? I don't have. I, I can understand the rationale. Uh, the, you know, the balloon injury that you have induced with your balloon at the ostium of the LAD might trigger some some concern on possible wrist stenosis or possible balloon induced wrist stenosis on the long term. As as you said, I don't have much of experience on that. Uh, but I guess you have selected your balloon based on the on the vessel size of the LAD as well. So I'm not sure we have induced much of a balloon uh, damage there that might trigger down the road wrist stenosis or, or new stenosis, let's say, not really wrist stenosis because we didn't implant any metal there. The, the, the impression also is that you have a lot of recoil in the, in the osteal circumflex. Uh, so I'm, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any study that has been also demonstrating the, the, mm. the use. And I guess that it might be perhaps an alternative in a very, very specific case. But I, I agree that what this case is demonstrating is that when you have the control of what you are doing with imaging, etc., etc., you can achieve a fantastic result by stenting. I, I will just show you the final uh, images. So you remember that uh, we had, oh, sorry, uh, we had some um, um, under expansion of the of the proximal circumflex that we corrected with a non-compliant balloon, and now it looks much better. And uh, finally, we are also able to perform and uh, just to reconstruct with the 3D tool the stent. And you see that is not a cylinder anymore. It just scaffolds the left main and the left circumflex and with a nice opening towards the, the, the osteal LAD. And uh, I think that uh, it's really reassuring for us and uh, that, that's really supportive about the, 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 the good result on, on, and also on the long term. So, of course, this kind of procedure should be evaluated and, and to see if it's safe and if it provides a plus into the future. But once again, uh, we have some ongoing studies uh, that will help us to, to, to understand this point in the future. Now, one, another aspect that can be important to highlight is that one of the specific risks that you have in left main stenting is that the possibility of interaction between the guiding catheter and the stent is very high. And, and actually, the Excel study, for example, demonstrated that in nearly 7% of the, of the cases there was a stent distortion that was disclosed by intracoronary imaging, by IOS, and sometimes gets inadverted. So um, it is clear that you know, this, uh, this increases the safety of the procedure in terms of identifying sometimes um, a, a damage of the stent that may have happened and that can be corrected and otherwise may have consequences if left untreated. So I think that the, the, what we could, uh, before taking some uh, comments from the colleagues, uh, we should recommend them to go to this publication that was simultaneously done in European Heart Journal and Euro Intervention. It's uh, a consensus document generated by EAPCI on the use of imaging for guiding percutaneous interventions. Um, and I have chosen this particular image because there is no need to go into detail into every aspect of PCI guidance that is reflected there, because we have seen it in the cases that you presented. I mean, uh, selection of the of uh, the landing zones, uh, exclusion of uh, dissections, ensuring that there was optimal expansion of the stent, etc. I think that this has been nicely covered, but we probably could recommend to the colleagues uh, going to this publication to have uh, additional information in depth. We have some other questions from the colleagues that we can take. We still have five minutes more for the round table. Um, one of them is, uh, why not to put a stent up to distal left main from the circumflex and then to use a 4.5-12 millimeter stent up to the left main ostium? So that would be basically the idea of um, using two different stents Which to address the aspect of vessel mismatch. 
In well, this particular case, probably is not indicated. I mean, um, the lesion length was 15 millimeters, so it was it's not very long, and and I'm not sure that we will. I mean, I would feel a little nervous about trying to overlap two um, mm. 8.0 um, millimeters length uh, long stent, and also. I personally, I, I, I would be interested in having uh, Emmanuel's opinion, but if we can avoid to stent the left main ostium, if there is no significant disease, I think it should be avoided. I mean, it's not something that I like to do. For well, many I, reasons. I, I fully, I fully agree with uh, with your opinion. If we, if we can avoid the stent overlaps in general, that would be much better. We know that this is one of the predictors of stent failure. So this is certainly something we should try to avoid, especially when we are so close to an, such an important bifurcation. We can be as accurate as, as possible, but we can never be 100% sure that some of the stent struts will actually be uh, hanging in front of the ostium of the LAD. And that is exactly what we would like to avoid. If the concern of the colleague would be or was that in order to reduce this mismatch between left main and, and circumflex, we would need to stand. Another feasible option might be uh, to use self-expandable drug eluting stents. This could take care of the of large yeah. mismatch between daughter vessel and left main. This could be an option. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure the results will be as good as the ones we have from bal balloon expandable drug eluting stents, but this could address the concern of the colleague. I think it was very interesting also to see that there was some uh, potential m mini thrombus uh, or little thrombus over there. Uh, obviously, this is because it's a highly sensitive technique. Definitely. And I think that uh, it provides also an evidence that sometimes this may raise, you know, the point that perhaps the um, uh, anticoagulation was starting to fade, uh, etc. So it's, 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 it's a great... Uh, we had a lot of interesting messages coming from, from your case. I think that at this point probably we can wrap up. Um, uh, the session has been, uh, certainly I have learned a lot from your cases, uh, as always. Um, but I think that what it has become clear is that uh, in the context of left main PCI, angiography is certainly a very misleading tool. Um, we are not able to judge or to take all the elements uh, required to make critical decisions. Uh, and you have clearly highlighted that ranging from uh, assessing what is the hemodynamic impact of the stenosis in the left main and in other segments of the coronary artery, uh, assessing the dimensions, choosing the proper stent, etc., as ensuring that the um, expansion of the stent was uh, um, perfect. Uh, with that, we increase obviously the safety of the procedure and surely we contribute to long term patient outcomes. So, I really would like to thank you very much for preparing this, uh, this case. Um, and I, on behalf of uh, Emanuele and uh, Nicolai, I would like to thank you for being with us. I uh, would like also to thank Medtronic for the support of this uh, webinar, a very important one. We will continue with this uh, series of webinars dedicated to bifurcation stenosis. The next one will be entitled Case-Based Step-by-Step Culotte Technique in Bifurcation. It will be on June the 6th. And we will have the privilege of having Goran Stankovic, Bernasche Valier, and David uh, Hildike Smith. And with this, uh, we wish you all the best from the three of us. And uh, we thank you again for having joined this uh, webinar. Uh, on um, coronary bifurcations. Thank you.